This morning there are a number that were being baptized. Yeah, Tom and I are privileged and, uh, and honored to be able to baptize others in this third service as we've done in the first and second. I've said this a thousand times probably, is that, but I'll say it again. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And that inward change is somebody who has invited Jesus Christ in as their Savior, surrendered themselves, been forgiven of their sins, and received the Holy Spirit. And baptism is a first step of obedience to show family, friends, and the world that, who you've become. And so that's what we celebrate today. Okay. My name is Naomi Ruth Vogel, and I'm 11 years old. My life before Christ was selfish, proud, and not caring about other people. My life with Christ is better because I have joy and Jesus is helping me to treat others with kindness. And I know that he is with me because he gives me peace. I want to be baptized because Jesus was baptized. Naomi, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And is it your desire to live your life in a way that would honor him? And do you renounce Satan in all of his evil ways? Then I baptize you in the name of the Father. She's little. <laughs> and the Son. And the Holy Spirit. Very good. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this... Uh, this moment, and we pray for Naomi that you would bless her with an ever-increasing knowledge of your presence and guidance in her life. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, protect her all the days of her life, and uh, that her being blessed by you would uh, always be radiant to family and friends and people she works with and everybody she knows and doesn't know. Again, we pray your blessing, Lord, in Naomi's life, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Abigail Diane Vogel, and I'm 17 years old. My life before Christ was insensitive and not caring about others and full of fears of life. Now, with Christ, I'm not as fearful, and I'm becoming more sensitive to people who are hurting, and I'm trying to obey God and trust him more. The reason I want to be baptized is because Jesus told us to be baptized. Abigail, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? Yes. And is it your desire to live your life in a way that would honor him? Yes. And do you renounce Satan in all of his evil ways? Yes. And I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Abigail. We thank you for her faith and uh, in you for her courage to stand up here and to be counted That's right. as one of yours. Lord, we thank you. We ask that you would bless her every day of her life, protect her every day of her life until we're all called home. Yes. Thank you for Abigail. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Asanatu Janet Bangarua, and I'm 18 years old. Before Christ, I was uh, lost and felt unloved at times, even though I had my family. But there still was an emptiness that I couldn't shake. I was also very troubled and lost, and at that point, I didn't feel like I could be found. I gave up and didn't feel like I deserved anything good. Even though I believed I had him in my life, but I really didn't. But now I have found Christ, and I have made him in my life for four years now, and that's the best decision that I've ever made, and I have no regrets. And you never should have an ounce of regret believing in Christ because he believes in us. I feel freer and happier after I found Christ. I feel amazing and loved and beautiful after finding Christ. I feel like I can do anything and achieve anything because I have Christ. I want to get baptized today because I gave 
myself fully to Christ. Asanatu, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Yes. And do you commit yourself to following in all his ways? Yes. And do you reject Satan and all, all of his evil ways? Yes. And Asanatu, I baptize you in the name of the Father. Baptize you in the name of the Son. And I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Asanatu. We thank you for her decision to follow you, to live her life for you. And we pray now, Lord, that you would empower her by your Holy Spirit. That not only would she feel those, those attributes, which are so true, she's precious, beautiful, chosen, special to you, but that you'd enable her to convey that same message to friends and family, that likewise they are as well. That she could be a force, Lord, in the world where you've placed her. Empower her by your Holy Spirit to do what she can only do, you through her. We commit her to your care and your keeping. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. My name is Caleb Gettle. I was adopted when I was first born and have always gone to church. I've always known about who Jesus is and believed that he is God's son. I remember praying the prayer to accept Jesus as my savior the spring of 2008 at Midway Church of the Brethren. I then again prayed when I was at a friend's funeral a few years later. However, my choices in life did not line up with what I believed in. I struggled with anger, disrespect, stubbornness, and only being self-centered. My behavior caused a lot of stress for my family. It also made me feel bad about myself. All this led to me going to Bald Eagles Boy Camp. There, I am working on solving my problems in a better way. I'm also learning how to help others. I've gotten much better at a lot of things, but I still have a lot of room for improvement. I know with God's help, I can do great things. I'm learning to trust him more. I want now to be baptized to show my commitment to Jesus and to follow in his ways. You know, Caleb, you usually have to be over 40 to realize you still have a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations on getting that one right. Caleb, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And is it your desire to live your life in a way that would please him? And do you renounce Satan in all of his evil ways? Mm -hmm. And I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for Caleb's life. I thank you for the potential that this young man represents. And I pray, Father, you would empower him by your Holy Spirit to use all those gifts and abilities that you've so clearly given him to further your cause, your kingdom here on earth. I pray that you'd give him a love for people, a love that would be legendary, and a way, Lord, of communicating the love that he has for you to others. Bless him, Lord, in all his endeavors. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. My name is Trinity Kane. Before accepting Jesus, I was full of uncertainty of my future and had anger and bitterness towards God. I felt most alive when I was rebelling against people and authority. I felt that my life was meaningless and pointless. After Christ, I can see God working in my life to be more loving and accepting towards all people. I have more self-confidence and have a desire to share the good news about Jesus with others. It is through my relationship with Jesus that I no longer feel a sense of worthlessness. I want to be baptized because I want to openly proclaim to others that I believe in Jesus Christ, and I want to do what Jesus would like me to do. Trinity, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. And will you follow him all the days of your life? Yes. And do you renounce Satan in his wicked ways? I do. And Trinity, I baptize you in the name of the Father name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Trinity. Lord, as long as I've known her, even before she knew you, she had a way of just sharing uh, 
life in a, in a pure, uh, perceptive way. And I pray that you would continue to bless her in that because it just it helps other people see you, Lord. And I pray that you protect her and guide her. You'd be a blessing to her and her husband. We thank you for her family and friends. And I pray that Trinity would continue to be a beacon for you wherever she goes. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amazing service. Wow. We're in Luke chapter 22 this morning, and if you'd like a Bible to follow along, if you pop your hand up, someone will hopefully find you and bring a Bible to you. Luke chapter 22, verse 1. And as they're setting this up, let me just open with prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. And I pray this morning, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, we would be sensitive to you as you speak this morning. Lord, you do have a custom design message for every single person here. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would hear you this morning as you speak in maybe some areas that we've not surrendered to you. But through this whole service, Father, we'd allow you to address those issues and bring those to mind as we talk about this chapter today. We pray for the children's ministry going on next door, those precious young lives. Father, bless those teachers, bless the children as they learn day, Sunday by Sunday about a Jesus who will never leave them, who will never forsake them, who will never fail them, and as Jesus said, will not leave them as orphans in the storm. For all this we praise you and thank you and ask in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen. A drug enforcement officer, agent, approached a farmer and informed the farmer that he suspected that there were drugs on his farm and that he was going to check. The farmer, surprised, shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't know about any of that, but go ahead. Just stay on this side of that fence over there. The agent bristles and flashes out his badge, badge and rages at the farmer saying, this badge allows me to go anywhere and do anything I want to with the full authority of the federal government behind me. The farmer shrugged his shoulders, knowing you just can't argue with some people, and walked away to do some chores. Not two minutes later, he hears the DEA agent screaming from beyond the fence, running from the raging bull that was gaining on him. The farmer called out with a little smirk on his face, show him the badge, show him the badge. Well, that DEA's agent's bad had no meaning to that bull. But there is one name in the Bible that has a lot of meaning, but in a negative way, the name of Judas. I looked this up. Out of the current population in the United States of 319 million people, can you guess how many people have been given the name John? John. 13 million. That's surprising. Out of 213 million people, 313 million people, 319 million, 19, 13 million Johns. Do you know how many people in America out of 319 million are named Judas? 466. 13 million versus 466. There's a reason, and I bet there's a reason behind every one of those names, an interesting reason. Let's find out why people don't name their children chapter 22 verse 1 we pick up this morning it says a festival of unleavened bread which is also called Passover was approaching the leading priests and teachers of religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus reaction now it says the festival of unleavened bread which begins with the Passover celebration I'm afraid my oh there it goes the screen is acting up. It just came back on. The Festival of Unleavened Bread, which begins with the Passover celebration. Technically, these were two separate festivals originally. Passover was observed on the 14th day of Nisan, whereas the Feast of Unleavened Bread was celebrated on the 15th to, to the 21st of Nisan. 
But as time went on, the Jews decided that they would celebrate these together as one combined event. And instead of back to back, they were combined into the same week. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorated the Israelites' quick departure out of Egypt during the time of Moses when they left so quickly that there was not enough time for their bread to rise. Hence, the Feast of the Unleavened or Unrisen Bread. Passover, on the other hand, is in celebration of the night before they left Egypt when the death angel passed over the home of those who had obeyed God's command to simply put blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their home. Again, a clear parallel to Jesus' death on the cross. And then in verse 2, King James says this, And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. This one verse is loaded with meaning. First of all, do you notice a particular group that is missing here? Pharisees. They're not in this group. Morris, the commentator, said this, quote, In the Gospels, the Pharisees were Jesus' chief opponents through his three years of ministry. But the high priestly party took over at the end because they had the political connections. So who were these chief priests? Well, this was a very select group of men. It would have included the current high priest, Caiaphas. It would have included his father-in-law, Annas, who at one time had been a high priest. It would have included any man that had ever served as high priest or the blood family of these men. It was a very low number. Additionally, the scribes are listed here, and they were the teachers of the law, the lawyers of their day. And as we've often said, in Israel, there was no civil law. Every, every law was administered by the church, by the synagogue, by the temple. And so the scribes would also to settle legal disputes. They would write titles and deeds. They would write, uh, 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 um, sounds like, mm, mm. yeah, they would do a lot of things. <clears throat> but remember, the scribes created the detail of the law, and they had a symbiotic relationship with the Pharisees in that they would write the law, and then the Pharisees would dance to the tune and tempo set by the scribes. The scribes loved to write detail on the law, and the Pharisees loved to keep the detail of the law. And the reason this group was meeting, they were meeting in order to figure out how to kill Jesus. Now, if you think that any of their discussion was about <clears throat> if it's proper to kill Jesus, in all probability, not at all. These men had absolutely no reservation in killing off opposition. It's hard for us to consider this, but murder was very common in this era. Just consider in Acts chapter 5, when, the, when the, after Jesus resurrected and the apostles were given the power of the Holy Spirit and started doing miracles, we read this. It says, when they heard this, when the high council, when, the, when these re religious leaders heard that the apostles were doing miracles in Jesus' name, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. All 12. He's going to kill them. Going on to verse uh, chapter 22, it says, The high priest and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy. And as a result, it says this, When they heard this, the high council was furious, decided to kill them. The apostles are doing miracles. The religious leaders are jealous. Because they're jealous, they just decide we're going to kill them. In the book, why did... I'm sorry, or consider this passage from the Paul, the life of the Apostle Paul. It says Paul was going everywhere. This is before Paul was converted to Christ. Paul, Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. And not only to throw them into prison, but to death. Chapter 22, Paul says, I persecuted this way. The way is what they were originally, Christians were normally, in the beginning they were called the way. I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And then in Acts 23, verse 12, oh, that was 23, 12. So here's the idea. 
that Paul was sent out by the religious leaders to find Christians, bring them in, bring them to death, to imprison them, and even to bring them to death. In the book entitled, Why, this is a long title to a book, Why Did the Red Ribbon on the Head of the Scapegoat Turn White in 30 CE? The author, Tova Singer, writes this, quote, The Talmud bears record to the spiritual decay of interpersonal baseless hatred that was pervasive among the Jewish people during this difficult time. This represented the spiritual decline that was the chief reason as to why the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now listen to this. He said it was during this turbulent time that murders became so widespread that the Sanhedrin ceased to judge capital crimes such as murder. Now, in Judaism, only the Sanhedrin, that 71-member court, could try a capital case. Only one court, only the Sanhedrin. And they're saying that there were so many murders during this time that they stopped hearing murder cases. And that's a good thing because if the Sanhedrin would have heard murder cases, they would have had to heard cases against them for murdering people. What they're planning to do to Jesus, one included. But that segues into a very interesting question. If murder was only like a parking ticket to them, and it was, then why does it say what it says in verse 2? It says this, The leading priests and teachers of the religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. So it says they wanted to kill him, but they were afraid of the people's reaction because they were afraid the people would riot if they killed Jesus. You see, they were not afraid of the consequences of the murder. They, they would do that with impunity. They didn't care. They knew they could kill Jesus and get away with it. What they were afraid of was the riot that would follow the murder of Jesus. Now, why is that? Well, because Jesus was very popular with the people, extremely. And these chief priests and scribes knew that if they killed Jesus, the crowds would react violently against them. So they had to figure out a way for Rome to do it instead of them. Now, did they care about what the common people thought about them? I mean, is that why they wanted Rome to do it? Because they didn't want the bad public opinion of the people? No, they could care less about the people. These religious leaders had contempt and disdain and even hatred for the common people. In John chapter 7, there's a story told where the, the religious leaders send the temple guards out to bring Jesus in, and they don't bring him in. And this is what it says. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? Bring him? The officers answered, ne never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one, not one of the rulers of Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. You see, these religious leaders spoke of the uneducated, common Jewish man with contempt. Simple-minded, they called them people of the earth. Simple, uneducated, ignorant, dregs of society. And that they, what they did, they did because they knew they were doing it for God, and what the people thought didn't matter because they were just stupid, in other words. So these religious leaders could have cared less what the people thought of them. But they did fear a riot. Why is that? Here's a key. You don't ever want to forget this point. It makes this whole last week of Jesus make sense. The plotting and the planning. The reason is because these high priests and the entire high priest and members of the high priest family were fabulously wealthy because of their role as high priests. I mean Bill Gates wealthy because of their position as high priest. The Old Testament law dictated that the Jewish people were to give 10% of their income to the church, to the synagogue, to, to, to the temple, to, to tithes, to the Levites in particular. But 1% of that was to go to the high priest personally. So 9% went to all the Levites and the upkeep of the temple, but 1%, nine parts went to the, the Levites, but one part of those nine, 10 parts 
went to the high priest by himself. So it's estimated there were 4.2 million Jews during Jesus' day. If you take that 4.2 million and divide it by assuming there are six people in a family, that means there were 700,000 income-earning units. If you assume that as a unit they made $40,000 per year per family times 1%, that means the high priest by himself would have received $280 million a year. $280 million a year. Now Josephus, a trusted Jewish historian who lived at the time of Jesus, says that during this era there were 1,500 priests in Jerusalem. So even if you take the $280 million and divide it by the 1,500, because they said that the high priest would distribute some of this income to the other priests, even if he made an even split with all of them, each one would have received $187,000 per year out of this 1% uh, part of the tithe. Uh, and did the high priest give an even share to everyone? Probably not. People are people. And my guess is he kept a disproportionate share for himself. On top of that, all the money they made by selling animals on the Temple Mount, charging exorbitant prices for people that came to give their sacrifices. So they were fabulously wealthy. However, ever since Rome took away the sovereignty of Israel as a nation, when Rome started ruling Israel, Rome decided who would serve as a high priest. Prior to that, they decided who would be high priest. When Rome came to power, Rome picked the person, that, that one man that would serve as high priest. And what did Rome demand of the high priest? That he be able to keep these seditious, easily enraged Jewish people under control. Because Rome said, if you can't keep them under control, we will find another one who can. And remember, it meant losing a lot of money to be taken out of that position. So they worked very hard to keep the people calm and quiet and the reason Rome cared about that, the reason Pilate cared about that, is his position depended on the people being at peace. And that's exactly why the Jewish leaders, when you read this, it, it sounds like it's making two different points. It says they're, they're afraid of a riot. And so, yet they, they captured Jesus during Passover when there were over a million people in Jerusalem. You say if they're afraid of a riot, why would they... Why would they bring this whole issue to a head during the Passover. It's, it's the most likely time to incite a riot. Well, the reason is because if Pilate couldn't keep the people under control, Pilate would lose his job. And so it was a perfect pressure point to get Pilate when the city is flooded with people. And then the Jewish leaders come in and make the case against Jesus. And Pilate starts to see that the crowd is getting out of control, and he knows if I lose control of these people, I'm going to lose my position. It was genius on the part of the religious leaders. They were afraid of a riot, but a riot at their doing. A riot at Pilate's doing worked in perfectly to their plan. Going on then to verse 3, it says this, Then Satan entered Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples. Just as Jesus is always looking for men open to carrying out his objectives, so too is Satan always looking for someone to carry out his objectives. And Satan found his chosen instrument in Judas. Why did Judas do it? Why did he betray Jesus? Well, there are two reasons that are most often given. Number one was his greed and lust for money. In John chapter 12, we're told this about when the woman came and poured $12,000 worth of perfume over Jesus' head. It says, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. Listen, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Now, when we think about Judas betraying Jesus for money, it seems almost incomprehensible that someone could live three years with Jesus and betray him for just 
a couple dollars. But remember how common murder was. And remember that the disciples had not worked for three years. They had no income of their own. What if Judas had the mafia knocking on his door trying to collect gambling debts? Maybe threatening to kill his wife, because they would. Or kill his children, and they would. Or kill him, because they would. Impossible? Not at all. 30 pieces of silver, it's suggested in today's economy, would be about $6,000. $6,000 in cash. So us knowing how gentle and kind Jesus was makes Judas' betrayal for money seem almost unfathomable. And yet it could still be the reason. We know of children that have murdered parents, grandchildren that have murdered grandparents, all for money. So it is a possibility. But a second reason, more probable to me, was that it was an effort on Judas's part to try to force Jesus in to take on, taking on his role as conquering king. Maybe Judas had seen enough of the lamb side of the Messiah and now wanted to see the lion side. Let's get on with the real show, Jesus, the part where you finally become king and where we 12 disciples get to be regents ruling by your side. Let's get on with it. Enough. But in either event, Luke tells us that Satan entered Judas in order to carry out this plot. The Greek word for entered is ice erkamai. Ice erkamai. It can mean to go in or out of men or animals as into a house or into a city. It can mean of Satan taking possession of the body of a man. Or it can mean of things that enter the eater's mouth such as food. An example of where this is used is Luke 8, 33, where it says, Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pig. The word entered there is ice erkamai. They entered the pigs. They took possession of the pigs. <clears throat> so that leads to an interesting question. The fact that they took possession of Judas, could Judas have been saved? No, it's impossible. Because a believer cannot be possessed. Believers can be oppressed, but not possessed. And this Greek clearly indicates that Satan entered into, went into, possessed Judas. Now, do you know what's really interesting about that little piece? <clears throat> Pardon me. In Matthew 10, we read this. Jesus called his 12 disciples together, Judas being one of them. Jesus called his 12 together, including Judas, and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Well, did they do that? Matthew 6, 13. And they cast out, speaking of the 12, and they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with oil. They, the 12, Judas being one of the 12. So although Judas was not saved, he was able to cast out demons and heal many sick people. This helps add some context to these words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, where he says, On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. Judas would be able to say this. I cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles in your name. But Jesus will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Or King James says, or you workers of unrighteousness, lawlessness. So Judas wasn't saved, and yet he did these mighty miracles. So the point is, don't be conned by stories that you hear of where non-believers or cults are doing miracles. That, in fact, if you do, you're setting yourself up for the end-time deception. Speaking of the coming Antichrist, Paul writes this, warning us of this very thing. 2 Thessalonians 2, he says, This man, the Antichrist, will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. These will be wonderful miracles. Things that we would attribute to someone good because they're wonderful miracles. If you question that, look what, how Jesus puts a twist on this in Matthew 24. Jesus says, For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, 
even God's chosen ones, even God's elect. So these false prophets will do miracles. The Antichrist will do miracles. And because they're wonderful miracles, people will be led astray. You've been warned. Going on, Luke 22, verse 4 says this. And he went, Judas, went to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted, and they promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. Now, the leading priests, again, small group, the high priests, Caiaphas, Annas, former high priests, and here it adds the temple guards. Now, who were these temple guards? If you can put that next picture up. This is the temple mount on the left side, the temple area, and that building with the red arrow pointing to it was called the Praetorium or Antonio Fortress. Herod built this, and this is where the Roman soldiers stayed in Jerusalem. And the reason he built it right off the corner of the temple is because Rome knew that the very center of all the seditious, rebellious acts of the Jews came out of this place. It was always religious in nature. And that if they were going to have an insurrection, they were going to have a riot, if they were going to have a sedition, it was going to be based out of that place there. So they put their armory right on the corner. That's where Herod built it. The next picture, again, this was filled with Roman soldiers. However, Roman soldiers were not allowed on the Temple Mount. They were not permitted to go there. As a result, the Jewish people had their own temple guards, and these are the ones that they're talking about here. These are the ones that went to the garden and seized Jesus. So the temple had its own guards, but they were all from the tribe of Levi. Levi was the tribe of the priests, you remember. Twelve tribes, Levi was one of the tribes, and all of the priests came from that tribe. And these temple guards were from that tribe as well. First Chronicles 26.1, we read this. These are the divisions of the gatekeepers. That's what matters. Chapter 26, verse 1, these are all gatekeepers. Verse 17, further down, says six Levites were assigned each day to the east gate, four to the north gate, four to the south gate, and two pairs at the storehouse. The storehouse was their bank. It was their treasury. It's where they kept their assets. First Chronicles 26, 20 says this, other Levites led by Ahijah were in charge of the treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries of the gifts dedicated to the Lord. So these temple guards, when you read about them, when they come in the garden to take Jesus, these were the bank guards. They were the ones that guarded the possessions located in the temple. And some commentaries say that these guards actually managed the temple funds themselves, almost like treasury agents. And as such, they would have helped in negotiating this blood money payment to Judas, as well as maybe even doling out the 30 pieces of silver themselves. It's the role that they played in this scene. Going on to verse 6, we read this. So he agreed, Judas agreed, and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. You know, it's very interesting to note that they did not pay Judas to find Jesus. They paid Judas to tell them when Jesus was alone, which was practically never. Remember, they were afraid of a riot, so they did not want to take Jesus when there were people around because it would have helped to incite a riot. It wasn't hard to find where Jesus was. Went to, you go to where the people were. That's where Jesus was. But to find him by himself, whole different picture. And they needed one of the 12, one in the inner circle that could deliver him at such a time. And what was the reason for Judas's betrayal of Jesus? Well, as we said, at the worst, it was, collect, it was to collect $6,000 cash, perhaps to pay off some debt, who knows, maybe some gambling debt with Vinny threatening his life. There is a Vinny that goes to church here. I apologize, Vinny, for using that in a derogatory way. That would be the worst. At best, it was Judas's attempt to force Jesus' hand 
into taking his rightful title as conquering king and finally ending this cruel Roman oppression that the Jews had suffered under. But please listen to this. My guess is that if you would have asked Judas the night before he went to negotiate his deal with the temple guards, if you would have asked Judas, why are you doing such an awful thing? My guess is that Judas would have had his plan completely justified in his mind. I can picture him saying, hey, I'm, I'm really doing Jesus a favor. He finally gets to become the king that he deserves to be and that we as a nation have been promised and have been waiting for. Finally, we get delivered from this tyranny of the Roman rule. In fact, history will probably record me as a great hero. I'll be the one who finally helped usher in Jesus' earthly rule and reign. I'll go down in history. Well, he has, hasn't he? You see, Judas had a plan. And because he wanted his plan, he never asked Jesus about what Jesus' plan was. Because he really didn't want to hear about any plan rather than his plan. So how does today's lesson apply to me? Is there something that you are involved in some plan or some scheme or some business relationship or some personal relationship or some financial dealing that you will not take to God, have not taken to God, or surrender to God because you want what you want and are not willing to listen to a dissenting vote on that subject. Listen, folks, this sounds a bit innocuous, but this is serious. It's the sin of Judas. He wanted his plan over Jesus' plan and would not ask Jesus about it. And the reason there are only 466 people named Judas in this country today is simply because Judas would not yield his plan to God's plan. What about you? Are there areas in your life that you have not given to the Lord because you know what he might say or you're afraid what he might say or it might mean you having to give up your plan. Well, here's the good news. And this is really good news. The plan that God has for your life is a better plan than any plan you could ever choose for yourself. The plan that he has for your life is to bring joy, peace, contentment, fulfillment, satisfaction, that you will never find in your plan if your plan is different than God's plan. My wife and I, where is she? She's back there somewhere. My wife and I often laugh about the fact that I'm a pastor today and she is a pastor's wife. Because if you would have asked us when we were 21, if we ever thought I'd be a pastor, she would have laughed you out of the house. And if you would have asked her if she'll ever be a pastor's wife, she would have laughed you out of the house. That just wasn't in the offing at all. I might have shared this with you before. I love those stories where children go to their parents and their parents, after they become a pastor or in ministry or a missionary, and the parents say, you know, we always thought you'd be a minister one day. We always thought we prayed that God would would choose you one day to do ministry. We always knew. We prayed that you would be that. Or the stories of ministers where they said that their mother prayed for years that they'd be a minister and one day they... So I thought, I want to go to my mom and ask her. So I, I wonder... Because she never said anything. I said, Mom, did you ever have, ever have an idea that someday I'd, I'd be a minister? She said, not a clue. <laughs> not a clue. I'm telling you, this was off of everybody's radar screen. But here's my point. I could not love more. We could not love more what we do. Getting to serve you, live with you, be with you. Man, I tell you, it's... And yet, I would have run from this. In the day, I would have run. It what surrendering God's plan does. And every time you keep God out of the loop on a decision, it will cost you every time every time. The key to getting that right in your mind is to remember and focus on the fact that
that God loves you so much that his plan for you is motivated by love and he brings all of the resources that he has available to him to bear to bless you. And every time you hold out your plan against his, you're shortcutting yourself every single time. Surrendering to God's plan over your plan is never, never surrendering to allow God to do less than you are asking. It is always and only surrendering to God to allow him to do what you're asking or something even better. That's what his love does. His love cannot do less than best. He's incapable of doing less than best when you surrender your heart, your life to him. Your belief in his love for you is the key to you yielding your will to his will. You know, the Bible promises to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever dare or ask or hope. My guess is some of you could think of some really great things to ask for. Some of you could have some really great things to hope for. The Bible says that he wants to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all of that. He gets a lot of glory. (laughs) When we're in a situation and we're afraid to trust him, but we do, and then he comes through. In the book of Psalms, we're told, he says, I want you to trust me in your times of trouble so I can rescue you and you can give me the glory. I want you to trust me in your times of trouble so I can rescue you and you can give me the glory. Let's close in prayer. As we close in prayer, I ask you, are there areas this morning that you know the Lord's been talking to you about, that he's been addressing, that, he, that you've, he's wanted to come into that discussion on, but you've pushed him away? Is there some relationship? Maybe it's a woman, a man at work, and there's an inappropriate relationship forming. And you have this conviction, but you're convincing yourself. You have it all wrapped away neat and tight. We're just friends. It's just a friendship, but you know there's something wrong about it. Maybe there's a business dealing, something you're involved in, and because of it, it, you're compromising an area of your life, and you know the Lord is convicting you not to do that, but you want your plan. Maybe you're a young person, and you have set in your mind something you want to accomplish in life, and you're just not willing to give it up to the Lord, to surrender that to Him. Listen, in every single one of these cases, You're holding back God's best. (laughs) You're limiting God from doing what he wants to do, which is to bless you. If you want to give that to the Lord this morning, I invite you to pray this prayer. Just repeat this silently in your heart after me. Father, on this issue, I surrender this to you. My desire is your best in this situation in my life, whatever that means. I believe in your love for me. I believe you do want what's best for me. And on this matter, I surrender this, I give this to you. And if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you've seen these baptisms this morning, but you've never taken that first step. If you'd like to do that, I invite you to pray this prayer right now. You can pray this silently in your heart. God can hear your heart. Just repeat this after me if you'd like to do that. Father, I acknowledge that I've sinned. I have made many mistakes. I have sinned often, and I ask you to forgive me. And I do receive Jesus' death on that cross as payment for my sins, that I could be redeemed, that I could be set free from the penalty that I deserve for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. Now help me to live a life, Lord, that would honor you, that would please you. So again, Father, we thank you for your presence here this day. And I pray you would remind us, Lord, that your love is what motivates you to do all that you do in our lives and that you truly do desire to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we could ask or even imagine. And for this we praise you and thank you and ask in Christ's name and all of God's people said, amen. Would you please stand for the closing song? And if you'd like to talk to someone this morning, there'll be... Men here to pray with men, women with women. We encourage-